ask you to turn your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 11 this morning as we continue in our series that we've entitled Heroes from Hebrews, looking at uh, the different characters in what has been titled the Hall of Faith, uh, looking at ordinary people who God, through faith, used to do extraordinary things. And uh, we have been journeying to see how these ordinary people um, were used by God to do great things. And hopefully, as we're going through this, we're not sitting there and enshrining them and saying, well, I wish I could live that way. I wish I had the abilities to do those things. I wish I had that kind of faith. Uh, And so we'll just kind of worship them. We'll kind of revere them as these great individuals. Our hope is, is that you would stop and say, I want that kind of faith. I want to do bold things for the Lord. I want to serve God as these men and women did, and and I'm going to learn from their example how to do it. And, And we can do that because we have living inside of us the Spirit of Almighty God, and we have been bought by the blood of Jesus Christ, who is the author and perfecter of our faith. And so God wants to write a story of faith through you. And God is perfecting that faith that you have. And it may be feeble, and it may be immature at times, and it may find itself wavering at times, but Jesus is writing a faith story for you and I, and he is seeing that work being finished in us. And as we're going to learn, as we're going to grow, God is going to give us greater and greater opportunities to use that faith for his kingdom and for his glory. And this morning, uh, we come to the second second installment of our study of Abraham. Now you know that Abraham, as if you were here last week, Abraham is uh, given the most press, if you will, in Hebrews chapter 11. He has the most verses dedicated to him, and we took two weeks to look at uh, two different faith experiences that Abraham had. The first one last week we learned about was that Abraham was called by God to leave his home in southern Iraq and head to what is now modern-day Israel. And he would do so without knowing where God was calling him, without knowing what was going to be expected there, he went on the word of God and was obedient. And we have seen how God may be calling us to uncomfortable places. God may be calling us to unfamiliar ministry opportunities and that we need to uh, be willing like Abraham to walk in faith. But today we come to what is, quite frankly, an uncomfortable story. Probably one of the most uncomfortable stories in all of the Bible. It's difficult for us to wrap our mind around the test that God is going to give Abraham. It's going to make us feel altogether uneasy. We're going to have questions that are going to come up and say, how could a loving God, how could a righteous God, how could a good God, Expect one of his servants to do the very thing that God is going to ask. And this morning, we're going to have to wrestle that sometimes God is going to ask us things, quite frankly, that confuse us, quite frankly, go against every instinct of our humanity. And there will be times where we have to let go of our prerogatives and our thinking, and even some of the most important things in this world, to obey God. And that's why Abraham is described as a man of great faith, because he did that. You see, the question I want you to think about this morning is, do I have enough faith in God to offer back to God all that I have and hold dear? I want you to think this morning as we talk this question, what is your Isaac. Abraham is going to be asked to sacrifice the most valued possession, relationship, um, uh, person in his life, the promised boy that God had said would one day come. He has waited his entire life for this boy, and God is going to say, I want him back. And the question this morning is, what prize possession What element in your life, what Isaac do you have in your life that God is asking? Let me rephrase that. God is requiring you as his son or daughter, as his follower, to give back and offer. 
as an act of worship. You see, whatever that thing is, and it could, it could be a sin, but for many of us, that prized thing, that wonderful thing that we nurture and want to grow and we want to see come to full fruition, are sometimes the most lovely and dear things in this world, whether they're people or, or ministries or opportunities. So these aren't sinful things. And yet the Bible tells us that anything that takes place, uh, takes God's place in our lives is an idol. Elizabeth Elliot once wrote this. She said that the Christian life and Christian growth is about breaking down the idols in our lives one by one. Oh, how painful it is because by definition, she says, we love our idols. We protect them because they give us strength, hope, and meaning. We have idols in our lives, and many of them we don't think about being idols, and we'll talk about this later in the message, but we think of idols so differently than the way we should. Abraham could have made his son, Isaac, an idol, but he doesn't, and he's willing to offer that prized possession back to God. Today, I want us to walk away knowing and understanding what kind of faith that takes, and hopefully, by God's grace, that we might rise up and have that kind of faith as well. This morning, we're going to look at Hebrews chapter 11, verses 17 through 19. And so get your uh, finger to that part of the Bible. And then I also want you to have in your uh, hand Genesis chapter 22. Genesis chapter 22. And we're going to be in those two places today. And I'm going to go ahead and read, uh, first of all, from Hebrews. And then we will jump to the storyline so we can understand exactly what the writer is talking about in Genesis 22. So let me go ahead and read that for us this morning. We are told by faith, verse 17, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. He considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. Now go to uh, verse, or chapter, Genesis chapter 22 for a moment at the very beginning of your Bible. And we have to ask the question, what's he talking about? What's this, this offering up of Isaac? What, what's going on? Well, Genesis 22 is going to help us and we're going to understand the storyline. So Genesis 22, starting in verse 1, After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and Abraham said, Here am I. He said, Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. He cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son. And he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So they were both of them together. And Isaac said to his father, Abraham, my father. By the way, just as a point of reference, this is the only conversation in all of the Bible that we see of Abraham and Isaac having with one another our patriarchs of our faith. This is the only conversation that takes place in the scriptures. And Isaac said to his father Abraham, my father, and Abraham said, here am I, my son. He said, behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went, both of them, together. When they came to the place of which God had told them, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order 
in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here am I. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God, seeing that you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold him, behind him, was a, caught, it was a ram caught in a thicket by his thorns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide, as it is said to this day. On the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. Let's pray. Oh, Father God, we come before you and we come to one of the most difficult passages in all of Scripture. Lord, We have seen your love, we have seen your compassion, we have seen your grace throughout. And yet we come to a passage where seemingly you, uh, from our vantage point, go against everything that you say, go against everything that we know about you. This doesn't make any sense, Lord, from a human standpoint. Lord, it is in these moments that all of us should cry out, It doesn't need to make sense to us, Lord. You don't have to um, excuse yourself. You don't have to um, uh, give us reasons for why you do what you do. You are God and we are man. And and we will humbly uh, believe and trust that you have got a plan, even at times when it confuses us. Lord, I thank you for Abraham's example. I thank you for what you teach us in this incredible storyline. Let us be able to move beyond all the questions that we have to see the application that is so full in this passage. Lord, I pray that not only myself, but these, my friends, will be able to learn from Abraham's example and that we may walk in faith, offering the things that are so near and dear to us that we might honor you in all that we say and do. We love you and give you the praise for it. In Christ's name we pray, amen and amen. Well, about a year ago, I was going a mile a minute. There was so much happening from a church standpoint and a work standpoint and a family standpoint. I had made the decision that we were going to go on a a uh, last-minute summer trip out to the East Coast, and and, uh, I uh, uh, packed up the car, and we did a whole marathon uh, drive out to the East Coast. We did all the activities, and I made this marathon trip back. It's been 14 hours to get back, and I got home, and I went right to work and preparing a sermon and I had a wedding to perform that weekend and I knew and maybe you've been at this point where you know you are running on empty you know that if you just you know you start looking at at a day and say if I can just get to this day everything will be okay But with every breath that was being taken, I knew that there was not enough oxygen, there was not enough energy that I was going to make it happen. But I'm dumb, and I blow through all those warning signs, and I thought, you know what, I'll get through it. Well, to be honest with you, I was standing right here when it caught up to me. I was performing, uh, Brandon, he was just up here, Brandon and Tori's wedding. And I remember thinking, I'm tired, but all I got to do is get through the wedding and everything will be okay. Dum Dum didn't know he had to preach the next day as well and still a lot of prep to be done. And so I'm standing here and as the wedding party is coming down, I start feeling like my body is literally collapsing from the outside in. And I begin to start having this cold sweat, not the hot sweat I usually have, but the cold sweat. And I begin to feel my chest start to tighten up. And I'm thinking, oh dear Lord, I think I'm having a heart attack. But dumb, dumb me, instead of raising my hand and saying, I think I'm in cardiac arrest, I'm going to keep going. And so my cadence began to pick up. 
because we're going to get through this wedding, whether I die through it or not, we're going to do it. I was a sweaty mess. I remember uh, Tori and Brandon looking at me thinking, my goodness, man, there's like a slip and slide falling from his head. And and I'm thinking, just get through the wedding, just get through the wedding. These wonderful kids have this wonderful thing, just get through the wedding. And I remember I was supposed to give an announcement to the, uh, uh, the people that were attending. And I did as I'm hurrying off the stage running, because I'm like, now it's not to get to Sunday night after everything was done. It is, I want to get out of in front of being in front of people somewhere so I can just sit down. I made it to the sound booth and I fainted. I collapsed. And uh, Amanda was brought to me, and, and uh, she says, what's going on? I said, I, I think I'm going, like Red Fox from San Francisco. I think this is the big one, okay? And uh, so she says, you know what? You look pale. You don't look right. And I swear, she's used to that. And, and so she took me uh, to the emergency room, and I get there. My blood pressure is all out of whack and everything, and it would land me three days in the hospital. And what they thought for sure was heart issues. I mean, I know I've got a marathon runner's body. I know heart issues would never be an issue. My diet is so well-ordered and all of that. You know, I'm not a prime candidate for cardiac arrest at 42 years of age. But what they began to do is, is figure out what's going on, and uh, on the third day that I was in the hospital, they made a decision that they said, listen, we don't think it's your heart, but we want to do one more test to be able to make sure it's done. And there's two ways you can go about it. Uh, we want to have you do a stress test. And uh, we can do it medically, uh, but that can be difficult, and it can give false positives and stuff like that. What we want to do is get you on a uh, stepping uh, treadmill. And looking at you, it shouldn't take more than four to six minutes to get your heart rate to the right place. And so uh, I get on this treadmill, and I hear the nurses, and they've got a above or over under on how long it takes either for the person to die or for uh, you to hit your 170 beats per, per second. So four to six minutes uh, per second. That's what it was feeling like. <clears throat> four to six minutes. 27 minutes later. 27 minutes later. I'm wanting to write a book, 27 Minutes in Hell. Um, <laughs> I remember we were in the basement of the hospital, and I'm so tall, and we were at such an incline. She's like, we're just going to go a little higher. I'm thinking I'm on the stairway to heaven, but it didn't feel very heavenly. 27 minutes later, I finally got my heart to where it needed to be. I needed another three days in the hospital just to recover. And they found out, and they said, your heart's great. My doctor, God bless him, he said this. He says, you've got the body of a sumo wrestler uh, on the outside and a marathon's heart on the inside. Well, God bless you, skinny little doctor. <laughs> All right? And so what they did, now you say, why in the world? Oh, my gosh, this is like the worst illustration of all time, right? What the doctors did was intentionally intentionally put me in a place where I felt like I was going to die to find out how my heart would do in adverse circumstances. And the only way they could do that is to put me in a situation that would literally put me to the edge of my existence. I mean, they were going to stretch me as far as I could go. I remember thinking, I can't do this anymore. I've got to be getting close. And that was the first 45 seconds. <laughs> All of that to be said, God does stress tests of faith in our life. God intentionally puts you in situations. You may be healthy. You may be vibrant. Things may be going well. Everything may be in proper order. But God puts you on a spiritual treadmill that keeps escalating higher and higher. And it gets harder and harder. And your spiritual faith and, and its muscles are, are stretching to points that you never thought possible. And you, you want to say, I want out. I can't tell you how many times in that time frame I wanted just to say, listen, I have a bad heart. Let's just own up to it. I'll do whatever you need me to do. Whatever I've got to eat, I give up. I don't want to do this anymore. 
But likewise in the Christian walk, God wants to know how are we going to respond when we're pushed to the limits. Today, as we look at Abraham sacrificing or could sacrificing uh, Isaac, it pushed Abraham to the limits. And we can ask the question, why God? Why would you do that? I was asking that question of the doctor. Why would you do that? You get some morbid curiosity of watching a large man die a slow and arduous death. And some of us are wondering, why God do you stretch me? God, why do you push me to the limits? And there's a couple things that I want you to see. In fact, three things this morning, three lessons about why God pushes us and gives us what I want to call the ultimate stress test of our faith. First of all, I want you to notice, and this is so important this morning, that we need to recognize God has the right to test our faith. God has the right to test our faith. In Hebrews 11 and Genesis 22, we are told that God put Abraham to a test. This isn't the devil. This isn't an enemy. This isn't some adversary. This isn't trials and tribulations that seemingly bad things happening to good people and no one can explain it. This is God, and he is testing his child, Abraham. Now, right away, we need to recognize something. The, the idea of test is very, very different than tempt. Satan tempts God tests. James tells us God never tempts anyone to do anything evil. It's against his character to do so. Satan uses tempts or temptations to destroy us in our walk with God. God used tests to develop us in our faith. And God has the right as the creator God, as the omnipotent, omniscient God, to not only test us, to really to do whatever he wants, whenever he wants, however he wants. And we come to this passage and we see God is going to test Abraham. Now Moses makes it clear this is God's hand. God is doing this. Now this isn't the only person that God would test. God would test many of these other men and women of faith. He would put them in situations, trying and difficult situations. He would stretch people beyond seemingly human capacity. He would do that with Moses and Joshua. He would do that with some of the judges in the book of Judges. He would do that with Samuel. He would do that with David and Solomon. We know that God would test his disciples and he would allow them to be stretched and, and he would allow them to grow. And we see that most personified in the relationship that God had with Peter and, and some of the trials and tests that, that came their way. We know that the disciples during the church of Acts were tested in amazing ways. We know the apostle Paul says he was tested over and over again. God is in the business of testing his people. And we need to recognize this morning that maybe today you're in a test. And the reason why you find yourself in the circumstances you find yourself in, maybe why you've experienced the loss that you've experienced, maybe because of some of the hardships that you've got going on in your life and you're trying to figure it out. And I want you to know, it may be the devil, that could be it. It could be an adversary who's trying to do you wrong. Or it could be, it could be God putting you to a test. Trying to see how you're developing in your faith. Now, a couple things about these tests. Now that we know God has the right to do it, number one, we see these tests come after calm seasons of life. So much has happened since Abraham has made it to Canaan. Remember, he's 75 years of age when God calls him to go and, and to find a new land that God is going to lead him to. And he finds himself in Canaan as a 75-year-old man, and he is without child. He's, got his, uh, he's buried his dad. He's got his nephew Lot with him, and he's got his wife Sarah and his possessions. And he's made home in Canaan, and he's hanging out. Now, the text tells us 
at the beginning of verse 1 in uh, chapter 22 of Genesis, after these things. Well, what things? Now, we know at this point that Isaac has been born. So we know that 25 years have transpired because we know Isaac was born uh, around Abraham's 100th birthday. And so 25 years has transpired, and we don't know how old Isaac is. And their commentaries say he was as young as 8 to 10. Uh, he had to have been uh, strong enough to carry wood, so he needed to be probably a, a young boy who was able to carry things like a, a bundle of wood. Some have him as old as 30. Now, 30 seems a bit odd because you got a 30-year-old versus a 100-year-old. If my dad was trying to put me on an altar to kill me, I think I'd wrestle him, all right? And so I'm going to believe, based on just kind of human speculation and reasoning, that, that Isaac is still a young boy, okay? He, he's still a young boy, strong enough to do some tasks with his dad, uh, but not so big that um, he doesn't have respect and honor and trust of his dad as a young boy would. And so Abraham, now over 100 years of age, and it tells us now, so probably for 30 years, 40 years, Abraham has been hanging out in Canaan. And we are told after these things, well, what's going on right before this? I want you to recognize in chapter 21 is a treaty with a man named Abimelech. And what has transpired is, is that there was this dispute over water, this dispute over wells, and Abraham goes and says, listen, I've been very fair as a sojourner in your land. I've caused no trouble. I've always been a gracious neighbor and all of that. But some of your men, Abimelech, have, have taken a well of mine, and water was so important back in the day. Without water, you couldn't feed your family. Without water, you couldn't have a farm. So this water issue was big, and Abimelech says, yes, you've been a blessing. You have always uh, been uh, very noble with me. Um, he says, I'll take care of it. And he gives them a portion of land, which is the land of Beersheba. And, and we are told uh, in, in the text that after this discussion takes place in, in the passage, notice in, uh, let's see here, Genesis 21, we see that um, it tells us that uh, in verse 33, Abraham planted a Tazmarisk tree in Beersheba, and he called there on the name of the Lord. Now, let's remember that Abraham has been sojourning. He's been moving. He lives in tents, and he just kind of finds a place to live for a while and goes and, and lives somewhere else. And, and he's been going from place to place. I want you to imagine for a moment he's living the RV life, right? He's going from campsite to campsite. He's got everything he needs, and where he plants himself is where home is for any period of time. Now, it tells us that he plants a tree, when you are living the RV life, the last thing you do is plant a tree at the campsite, right? And so what we've got going on is Abraham has finally found a place that he can call home. He likes the neighbors. There's a treaty there. There's going to be no issue. Even when there was issue, Abimelech, who was this great leader of his clan, he took care of it. He respected Abraham. But I think there's even a bigger issue on why the RV life isn't going to work for Abraham anymore. That's because he's got a son. And the RV life doesn't, it works for seniors, right? But it doesn't work long term with kids. Kids need a place. They need a place that they can call home. They need a place where they can run. And so Abraham plants a tree. says, I'm going to hang here for a while. Maybe he's got this idea that one day he's going to hang a tire swing. I know they didn't have tires back then. But a tire swing for Isaac Whatever the reason is, it seems that he is saying, I'm going to be here for a while. And what we see in that for a while is peace. While there was all kinds of issues in Abraham's first coming to Canaan, for the last part of his life, things have been good. He's had his son. He's found a place to live, and everything is going well. Listen to all of you this morning who say, we are living a good stretch right now in your own personal life. Be ready, because that's when God tests. God seemingly finds us in places of peace when the tests come. Because he's living, he's enjoying himself, he's enjoying his son, and here now God says, 
I've got a test for you. And the test is the greatest test that Abraham would ever face. Quite frankly, it's the greatest test that I believe a father could face because it involves his son Isaac. Oh, how he loved Isaac. Remember, he had been told um, after years and years of infertility, after years and years of, of the lamenting with the, his wife Sarah, after years of waiting and then giving up hope, at 100 years of age, at really 99, God comes and he says, that promise I gave you next year, this time, you'll have a kid. And, and Sarah laughs. Are you kidding me? I'm old, she says, and my husband, he's as good as dead. There's no way this is going to happen. And we see that God is faithful to his promise, and Isaac is born. And Isaac is a wonderful little boy. I have three sons myself, as you know, and I love my sons. I cherish my sons. My sons bring me more joy than anything I could ever do on my own. I've been telling people now that my boys are of, of playing age and, and, and doing sports and all of that. As an athlete myself in, in school, I would far rather take watching my children play sports than me doing it myself. I love it. There's just something about it. There's just something about watching the gifts that God has given you and watching them do what God has given them ability to do and just sit back and, and enjoy that blessing. Listen, this is a hard sermon for a dad of three boys to preach. And what God says to Abraham is he says, I want you to take your son. And the text says, and Moses is so good at this, he says, I want you to take your only son. Now let's just remember, Abraham had another son, Ishmael. And it shows this incredible relationship that Abraham had with Isaac. I want you to take your only son, the son whom you love, could I get an amen from dads who have sons of that love relationship? Is that true? The sons you love, amen? The horseplay, the unlimited energy, the running around, the, the fishing, the camping, the sports, the, the, uh, all the activities that young boys have, the joy that a, a young boy brings to the heart of a father. And, and God has been so gracious in giving this son to this old man, and he knows it, and he recognizes it, and it's his job to protect this kid and make sure this kid of promise is never harmed and never hurt. And he hears from God. He says, listen, what I want you to do is I want you to take your son, and, and I, 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 I know we've got young ears in here, but this is so important. The practice would have been burnt offering to cut him up into pieces and to burn him. That's what God is requiring. Oh my gosh. As a 14-year-old kid, I watched my father grieve the loss of his 16-year-old son. It was beyond unbearable. Watching a father bury his son. No one should ever have to do that. But this is worse. Not only will he bury his son, but he will have been the pr person with premeditation who would have ended his life. And this is what God has said. I hope you see the absolute, from a human standpoint, absurdity of this command. Now, let's just be honest really quick that this wasn't uncommon in the day. Followers of Molech, followers of, uh, of the Canaanite gods, uh, like Baal. This was an ongoing practice. People would sacrifice their children all the time. And they would do so as the ultimate sign of allegiance and love to their God. I will give you all that I have, even my own posterity, my own children, sacrifice to you to prove to you and the world that you are most important, O God Molech or O God Baal. 
It was common in the day. And so I don't want you to think that it was uncommon. And, and, and you will say, well, how barbaric. Are you kidding me? This is terrible. We live in a country where, and we should be concerned about children being taken from their parents and the whole debate that's going on right now with the issue of immigration. And we sit there and go, what a barbaric group of people killing their children. Well, let me remind you, let me remind you, America, we have killed a third, one third of our population, child population through abortion. And we call it a choice. We look at it as a convenience. So let us be so very careful not to look and say, what a moron Abraham is. Why would he sacrifice? We do it every day. And we do so without batting an eye. We live in a country that sacrifices its children all the time. At an amazing rate. And so let us not prejudge Abraham or the people of Canaan as barbaric Neanderthals who didn't know any better. For we are a civilized country with all the technology in the world. Everything tells us that what we do to our children through abortion is violent and horrific. Science tells us that. And we keep fighting tooth and nail to keep it law. Shame on us. But here is what Abraham has going on. Abraham has been asked to do the horrific. I want to stop right here and tell you that when God tests us, they will usually, write this down, they will usually confuse us, but they will make total sense to God. So when God tests, the last question you need to say is, Lord, why are you doing this? Or help me to understand from a human experience why. You're not going to understand it. I believe the loss of my brother was a test for my parents to develop their faith, to grow their faith, and it has done so wonderfully. It hurts, and it was painful, but it's developed my parents into followers of God that they never would have been without that trial and tribulation in their life. But can I just tell you something? From a human standpoint, I've never had that question answered. God, why would you take a strapping young man, 16 years of age, a firstborn son, why would you take him and end his life, snuff it out? It don't make any sense to me. It don't make any sense to me, but it makes total sense to God. And the longer we give God time to allow his grand plan to be lived out, the more and more we might understand. But I've got to be honest with you. My brother died in 1990. And my parents still don't understand the full reason why all this happened. And so that question is futile to sit there and say, well, I want to know, I want to understand, I want to figure it out. Sometimes we just got to let go and let God and say, God, you've got it under control. This makes perfect sense to you. When I was a child, my grandmother had all these needlepoint portraits up on her, on her uh, wall. Beautiful needlepoint pictures. And I remember one time we had to take them down and dust them and all of that. And I remember as a young boy, I was looking at one of them, just amazed at how, how the fabric formed this picture. But when you turn the needlepoint over, what did you see? Frayed ends. Tangled. There was no picture. There was no nothing. It made no sense. I want you to know God is doing heavenly needlepoint right now. And he sees a beautiful picture. And we look up and we're like, well, why God? And we see all these frayed heads. We see all of this junk and all of this stuff. And it makes no picture for us. It's a mess. And God says, one day, in my timing, not yours, I'll show you the picture that I'm creating. And we've got to wait. But it confuses us. I, I want us to be honest this morning and recognize that what God is asking goes against everything that Abraham knew about his God. That his God was different than all the other gods. That his God loved people and had a plan for people and promises. And, and the thing that he is given is this job to do something that he couldn't even fathom. But notice in our text, we don't see Abraham say no. 
We don't see him say a derogatory thing towards God. We don't see him give up. We don't see him uh, be hasty and delay. In fact, in uh, Genesis chapter 22, verse 3, after he is told what he's going to do, Abraham, this kid that I promised you, you waited 100 years for, I want you to take him to a place I'm going to show you, and I want you to go up, I want you to bind him, and I want you to kill him, and I want you to offer him as a sacrifice to me. You can put whatever you want in verse 3. I am awestruck that in verse 3 it says, So Abraham rose early in the morning. Are you kidding me? I'm going to obey God. I'm going to get up early and do it. He had a faith. Listen, that's a day to sleep in. That's a day to say, you know what, we'll get to it from time to time. We'll delay. Maybe God will come back with a different word. I don't want to be too quick. No, Abraham says, God said something. I'm going to do it. Early in the morning, he gets up, and he goes about doing exactly what God has called him to. Now, how in the world could he have gotten there? Because right away, you, you and I will say, I could never do that. I could never uh, endure that. And, and we've been a part of people's lives where bad things have happened. Tests have come. And we look into people and, and Christians and we say, I don't know how they can weather that storm. Man, the world just seems to come at them over and over again. I could never do that. Well, if Christ is in you, yes, you can. Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. But how do we get there? I want you to notice the second point. God readies us through proper training. See, we take this story and we extrapolate it. We pull it from all of the other things that are going on in Abraham's life. And what we do is we do this. Abraham's called from uh, Ur of the Chaldeans to Canaan. He goes. A couple days later, he and Sarah welcome Isaac. And a couple of years later, he sacri- he's going to go sacrifice Isaac. Nothing's happened in between, nothing of significance, nothing of importance. Well, I want you to know that's exactly not the case. God is actively involved in Abraham's life. And what we do is we think that Abraham went from zero to a hundred in, in one step. But what we see Moses do, and Moses is an incredible storyteller, he tells the story how God has been interacting with uh, Abraham over and over again that gets him to the point that Abraham is willing and able to say, listen, God, whatever you require of me, I will do it. Well, how did he get there? Well, number one, his training, God's training, grows in intensity. And so it, it starts out small, and it moves to something bigger. Remember, God's first calling of Abraham is, I want you to leave. I want you to move. That's not too hard. People move all the time, right? That's not that difficult. But it's going to get worse and worse or more difficult and more difficult to the point I want you to kill your son. And we see that Abraham's willing to do it. Well, how did we get there? Well, it has grown in intensity. God says, I want you to move. Abraham moves. And then we see in a, just a cursory glance at the training of Abraham teaches us a couple things. Number one, and this is an important lesson that Abraham learns, and you, if you miss it, you will not make sense of God's testing of Abraham. The first thing that Abraham learns in his training is if you go it alone without God, you will fail. If you go it alone without God, you will fail. Every time... It's almost comedic how um, Abraham finds himself. Anytime Abraham makes a decision apart from God, it, it goes to utter destruction. It's brutal. He goes to Egypt, and he's like, listen, I got this beautiful wife. I don't want anybody hitting on her. And, so, and if they hit on her and they find out I'm her husband, then I got to defend her, and, and, and they'll kill me so that they can take her as their own. And, and instead of trusting the God of the universe, I'm going to trust myself. She's my sister, he says. And that doesn't work out too well. And God shows up. And then God uh, has, Lot get in, uh, has Lot get in some trouble. And Lot finds himself captured by a group of four kings. And Abraham has to go. And he has to save his nephew. And so he rallies 318 men of his clan. 
And he goes, 318 versus four kingdom armies. And the Bible says they killed them all. And he saves his nephew. 318 versus thousands. Hmm. God was in it. And then Abraham has to rescue his nephew once again because Lot moves into Sodom. And all kinds of sin is taking place in Sodom. And, and all kinds of, of, of judgment is coming Sodom's way. And, and Abraham starts talking with God and saying, God, if I find 50, God, if I can find 10. And he keeps going and he can't find anybody to the point that he has to rescue his, his nephew Lot. And what does Abraham see? That when you defy God, fire comes down from heaven. And so we have seen over and over again Remember, Abraham has experienced his 90-year-old wife giving birth after God has now twice told him he's going to have a child. And one year beforehand says, listen, by this time next year, there will be a baby in your tent. And God has been faithful. And I want you to understand something. God never moves you zero to 100. But he grows you. And, and he gives you greater and greater tests along the way. And remember, not to destroy us, but to develop us. And I've seen that in my own walk with God. The tests he has given me, listen, I am glad the tests that I have had to face as a 42-year-old man, the 22-year-old Tim didn't have to deal with. Because they're hard. They're difficult. Can I just say, and I don't mean this in, in my vantage point because I want to be fair to my children, but listen, God does not give us teenagers right off the bat, right? Right? They don't, the, the, the doctors don't come and say, here's your 16-year-old son. So he grows us and we play around and we do the little things and we think as the two-year-old, the terrible twos, oh, wait till the terrible 16s right? Oh my goodness. My son yesterday, he's not here. I can say this about him. My son yesterday wants to play basketball. Dad, can you move the car? Yeah, I can move the car. Give me a minute. I, I'm walking out. My son is moving the car. You can't do that. Well, you took too long. 16-year-old problems are way worse than two-year-old problems. That's why young parents get around old parents. We'll tell you some things, right? God gives us little problems and they get bigger and bigger and he doesn't do us to hurt us, but he does it to help us. But I want you to know there's a grace there and that is 42-year-old Tim has seen the grace of Almighty God get me through problem after problem after problem after problem. So this bigger problem in the here and now, it would have killed young Tim, but now it's just the next hurdle. It's just the next level that I've got to get through. And Abraham has seen God meet him every step of the way, but they will grow in intensity. Number two, I want you to see God's training allows us to imitate God. It allows us to imitate God. The similarities in this story are striking. Tests of faithfulness getting harder and harder. Trusting God being the key. Sacrifice that leads to sorrow. A father giving up his son. In this amazing story, we see Abraham walk the road God does. Did you hear what I said? In this story, Abraham walks the road that God would. Except, God went through with it on the cross of Calvary. And God didn't find some sacrificial lamb. Jesus was that sacrificial lamb. And, and Peter tells us in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 13, that our trials and our struggles and our tribulations, he says this, Be very, very glad, for these trials make you partners with Christ in his suffering, so that you will have the wonderful joy of seeing Christ's glory when it is revealed to all the world. We need to recognize that we worship a suffering Savior. We worship a God who gave up his one and only son whom he loved. And he did so for you and me. The final thing we see about this training is that it teaches us or helps us or forces us to determine what's most important. This is huge. Uh, 
I don't want to stretch this too far, but I believe that Isaac was Abraham's life, and who could blame him? Abraham loved Isaac, but Isaac could have easily, and maybe had, we don't know, we're not told, but maybe he had become an idol in Abraham's life. You see, we tend to associate idols with statues, gold and precious metals, and, and we think of blood sacrifices and all of this barbaric and, and ugly stuff, and we say, listen, I, I'm not an idol worshiper. I don't worship things like that. Martin Luther said that the human heart is a factory of idols. And you say, well, I don't worship gold statues. I don't worship those types of things. But maybe you worship your children, your spouse, your fame, your athletic prowess, your reputation, your, the nameplate on your desk. Maybe it's your home, your money, your education, your possessions. What are the things that are most important to you? What is it that you dedicate most time to? What do you find yourself getting your supreme joy from? Beware with those people and those things that you've not allowed them to become an idol because God is a jealous God and he will say, put it on the altar and kill it and prove to me that you love me first and foremost. Listen, brothers and sisters, Abraham had to make a choice of what was most important to him. The son he longed to have, whom he loved, or his relationship with God. Can I tell you this morning, on a beautiful June day, some of us have to have a Mount Moriah experience. Where we have to go and before God, we have to slay the very thing we love most so that we can love God without any partiality. How do we do it? God's recipe for passing the test involves trusting. So Abraham does everything God commands him to. In fact, he doesn't delay. Early in the morning he goes. Was it hard to trust? Yeah. Think about how hard it was for those three days. What it must have been like. But he does it. You got to wonder the faith, and maybe this is why Isaac is named in this right away. Isaac had to have faith. Nowhere does it say Isaac fights his dad. Got to be honest with you. Bill's going down. He binds me, sets up a charcoal grill. I'm taking the guy out. He's got a bum hip. We're going straight for that. Okay? You kidding me? Dad, where's the lamb? Don't worry about it. God will provide. I want to see it. I'm not liking where this is going right now, okay? And nothing of Isaac fighting. And that just says, and I'm running out of time, but that just says the amazing trust of a son to a father. And as a dad, I was thinking about this. Would my son trust my relationship and my word and my relationship with God enough even if it meant it radically changed his life, that he would say, Dad, I trust you. Some of us dads have some work to do with regards to the trust of our children. That when we go and say God's calling us to something, our children say, yeah, Dad, I'll follow. It involves trusting. Now, let's just... Let's just be aware that the writer of Hebrews gives us a picture into the mind of Abraham. In Hebrews 11, we are told that Abraham was confident that even if he killed Isaac, he knew God would bring him back. And so Abraham knows, listen, I'm going to kill my son, but my God is so powerful, so great, even if I kill him, God will raise him back up from the dead. I have faith in that. Now, isn't it amazing that even though Abraham trusted God, he had no idea what God was going to do? And some of us think trusting God means God gives you the whole game plan and you have it all figured out and say, okay, now I'll trust. Sometimes you've got to trust and say, all I know is God, you are good all the time. And I'm going to trust that. You have my best intentions in mind. You're going to take care of it. I'm going to trust you. I don't know how this is going to all work out. But I've got to trust. 
And sometimes we want all the answers and we don't have the answers in those waiting rooms. How are you going to fix this, God? I know you'll take care of it. I know you'll address it. And I know even if it means harm for me, it will be good and I'm going to trust you for it. He had no idea. He thought God would raise him from the dead. God had other plans. But I want you to notice two things. You can mark out the third one. It was never going to be a part of it, so I don't want you to think I'm shortchanging you. Some of you are very excited about that. But the first thing is, trusting is two things. Number one, being willing to grow. Nobody likes to be tested. Nobody likes to be tested and pushed to the limits. But church, we must see suffering and trials as something valuable and good. My greatest times of growth as a child of God have not been on mountaintop times of celebration, but in the valleys of the shadow of death. Because it is there that I meet God. It is there I see God so evident in my life. See and be willing to grow in your faith. Do not push off tests in your life. And second, You've got to be willing to see the grand plan. God had promises for Abraham and his posterity. And even though in this moment it didn't make sense, Abraham took the long view and said, God, you've got a plan. God, you're going to work this all out. And I want you to know your answer may not come in your 75, 80, 90 years of life. Your life may be full of questions, but I want you to know there is a plan I shared last week, no eye has seen, no ear has heard what God has prepared for his people. And so what are we to do? We gotta be willing to grow, we gotta be willing to see the grand plan, so we need to walk boldly with our God. We've gotta ask him to show us, day in and day out, his power. So when he asks us to do hard things, we're equal to that task by faith, to trust him and follow him. This episode in Abraham's life reminds me of a song we used to sing in Sunday school class, and it's a good word for us to close. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Let that be our motto this week as we walk in faith and obedience to God. Let's pray. Father God, we come before you and we thank you for your word. We thank you for this amazing story. And while we don't understand all of it, while we can't fully fathom all that you were doing there, we thank you for what you've revealed in your word about it and and, and the faith of Abraham. Lord, let us place our idols, let us place our most beloved things before you on that altar. Let us be obedient when you call us to hard things that we would do it so that you might be glorified and so that we might grow in our holiness and our relationship with you. How great it must have been for Abraham to pull his son off of that altar, to have passed the test and to place that sacrificial ram and to know God showed up. Lord, my friends here, some are going through very, very difficult tests, and I pray this week, Lord, that you would show up, that you would meet them, that the trial and the worrying and the concern and the fears and the anxiety would all be be swallowed up in your provision and in your grace. Thank you, Lord, that we have hope for tomorrow because you place your son on an altar. And you allowed him to be put to death so that we might have life. Thank you for this incredible foreshadowing of that great sacrifice. Now, Lord, wherever we may be going, whatever we may find ourselves doing, Lord, I pray that we would live out this faith and we would trust you and obey. Thank you, Lord, for this example. Now, give us the Spirit's power to be able to do this as we leave this place today. And it's in Christ's name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. God bless you all. Have a great day. Enjoy this beautiful Lord's Day. And we'll see you next week.